halfway through Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, proud Fitzwilliam Darcy proposes to prejudice Elizabeth Bennet and is turned down, not politely, because he has not behaved in a gentlemanlike manner. Specifically, Elizabeth accuses him of mistreating his foster brother, George Wickham. Here, from my novel, Pride slash Prejudice, are Fitz's thoughts as he writes the letter that will begin to change Elizabeth's mind. Her accusation ran in his head over and over. Had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike manner? All because of poor Mr. Wickham. Fitz ground his teeth remembering. So long ago, years, and still he could see it all seared into his memory. Christ Fitz, you're such a gentleman. You think you're God's gift, don't you? The large barn at Pemberley, George naked to the waist and his breeches around his knees, lying face down in the straw, but twisting the top half of his body around to smile up at Fitz behind him. Fitz had finished now, spent and limp, and lay partly on top of his beloved, an arm around his smooth shoulders, the bony, hairless chest. Fitz wondered if George had grown any hair in the five and more years since. Do you love me too? Fitz asked. He had been crying it into George's neck as he made love to him. A boy's passion that had matured and strengthened into a man's. I love you. I love you. George lifted his bowed head and turned to look up at Fitz. Love you? Are you really that stupid, Darcy? Do you honestly think I've put up with all this swiving and sweating for love? God, you're an imbecile. But generous, I'll give you that. Fitz hadn't had an inkling, not one suspicion, had he? All those years, from boyhood on into early manhood, all the whippings and the scoldings, the sad, stern lectures from his father. Fitzwilliam, I am dis disappointed in you yet again. I continue to believe you are not wholly bad, not irredeemable, that reformation is still possible, but sometimes I am close to despair. It had started out so innocently, a stolen apple or two from a farmer's orchard, a broken window from playing baseball too close to the house, the birds shot out of season when they were testing Fitz's new fowling piece, and always George used the same argument, that he was but the steward's son, forever dependent on the favor of his benefactor. The least sign of bad character, even a boyish prank, could be used as reason to relegate him to his rightful lowly position. He could be beaten or severely chastised, perhaps even sent away. But Fitz, son and heir, could confess to the crimes with no real consequences. He's your dad. George said, deliberately talking like one of the farmhands, emphasizing the distance in their station. Even though his father had been a gentleman and George had been educated the same as Fitz, you'll get off easy. At first, George had been correct. Old Mr. Darcy had reprimanded them and read them sermons, but he had seen nothing so very wrong in hungry boys plucking apples from a branch <coughs> overhanging the orchard wall or in a high-spirited ball game. The incident with the fowling piece had been another matter. Nobody hits a partridge by accident, he said. I thought you were old enough to handle firearms responsibly. Seems I was mistaken. He had whipped Fitz himself for that and taken the piece away for six months. They'd missed the entire shooting season. But George always made it up to Fitz. That first time when they were but 12 and 13, Fitz had been so unbelieving and ecstatic at the realization of what he had dreamed about for the entire past year as an impossible, unobtainable hope. He'd have committed murder for the chance, the merest chance of being granted a repetition of the favor. And each time, George barely had to hint at what he expected from Fitz and what he was prepared to offer in return. Nothing coarse or crude, only the half smile, the lowered eyes, the expression of remorse, and the glimpse of tears that Fitz seemed about to bomb. Then, as they grew older, the crimes became more serious. Stolen money, poaching, and last and worst of all, what had almost got Fitz disowned, the trouble with the cotter's wife. Fitz still felt sick when he thought of it.
George had been sneaking off every afternoon to some mysterious rendezvous. Unlike their other adventures, he wouldn't let Fitz share in this or even tell him what it was. Just a little sport, he said, when Fitz asked. I like sport too, Fitz said, smiling shyly at the reference to their usually unspoken pleasures. You know I'm not jealous, with, but can't you at least let me come along? Not your sort of thing, Fitz, George said, spitting for emphasis like the laborers, laborers he emulated. Just be my eyes and ears, will you? God, he'd been naive. It hadn't crossed his mind that George would want a woman. Ladies, that he could understand. But for boys their age, ladies were as out of reach as the high impures maintained in their own establishments by London's wealthy libertines. Of course, it was inevitable in such a close-knit community that the woman's husband caught them in the act. George escaped, running through the shortcut through the woods and into the park. But the man followed soon after, dragging his half-naked and sobbing wife right through the gate of Pemberley and across the gravel drive to the front entrance and demanding to speak to Mr. Darcy himself. No, sir, he said to repeated questions. Not your boy. It's the other one, the steward's son. The villagers and the farm laborers all knew Fitz and liked him. To them, he had always been honest and fair. It was only his father who had been deceived for so long, he thought he had raised the devil's spawn as his own. And Fitz had had to come into the room, tight and uncomfortable in George's two small breeches and shirt, and stand in front of his outraged accuser and swear that the man was mistaken, that it had been a natural confusion, both of them fair, less than two years difference in age. He nearly choked bringing the words out. He thought he was going to spew, that God would strike him down for the lie. That's what finally made it possible for him to do it, the knowledge that he was now lost to salvation, that he had damned himself, and that God would punish him. Hardest of all was saying such a preposterous thing to the woman. It was one thing to lie to his father. He'd been doing that for so long it almost ceased to trouble him. And the husband was clearly a brute and a bully and unworthy of the truth. But a wrong woman, that was different. Even a willing whore was entitled to be treated fairly, not insulted with an outrageous falsehood. Fitz dared to meet her eyes, squinting against the horror of her scornful, reproachful gaze as her wrathful husband forced her head up all the time saying, that's right, Betty. You look Master Fitzwilliam in the face, and then you tell me it was him. <coughs> Fitz took one look, the tangled dark hair over the large eyes, red with weeping, one of them blackened and swollen, the full lips cut and bleeding at the corner. A vision of hell, what he could expect, the demons, the furies who would torment him for eternity. He wretched, bent over with the dry heaves, but he heard George's pleas in his head, Oh, God, Fitz, you've got to get me out of this one. They'll kill me, literally. Please, Fitz, I'll do anything. You know I will. I'll be your slave for a month, anything you want, every night. Fitz pulled himself together and said, Yes, I'm sorry. It was I, Father. It was very wrong of me, I know, but I couldn't help it. It sounded so false, so absurd. How could anyone believe it? So he added, She's so beautiful, I couldn't help myself and the woman winked at him. Fitz must have recoiled or flinched because she gave a soft little gasp when her husband shook her, demanding that she corroborate the lie for all to hear. She wrenched herself out of her husband's grasp and said, yes, sir, Mr. Darcy, it was your son, Master Fitzwilliam. He pretended to be George Wickham because it's easier for a steward's son to come and go in the village without nobody noticing. That time the beating was so severe, Fitz passed out from the pain. His father hadn't done it himself, but set the blacksmith on him with the bullwhip. Fitz wasn't able to enjoy George's slavery for almost two weeks while he healed. And the settlement to the couple that husband had been taken out of Fitz's allowance. He had to beg George for spending money for the remainder of the school year. The only good thing to come of it was the visit from the woman. Almost a year later, with her child, both turned out of doors. She found the two of them in the barn, as usual, marched over to George, and shoved the baby in his face. When he stumbled back in disgust, she struck him, just hauled off with the back of one hand and knocked him down, the brat wailing on her hip. I'd do worse, but I don't want to hang and leave the poor babe without a mother. She kicked at George where he lay and looked Fitz up and down with an approving smile. Wish it had been you, love. You'd have done right by me. 
Before she went, she reached over and stroked Fitz's cheek. He thought she was going to hit him too, and he stood there, steady and unmoving, ready to take his punishment like a man, like King Charles I going to his execution, wearing two shirts so he wouldn't shiver from the cold and appear afraid, paying the fee to the man with the ax and giving him his blessing. God knows he deserved whatever she did to him. But all she did was talk. Give him a good hot poker up the arse from me, love, but stop being so daft. He's a very pretty fellow, to be sure, but you don't want to swing for him, neither. He ain't worth it. You're more of a man than he'll ever be. They said in the village she went to Manchester and opened her own house with 20 girls and a liveried man at the door. But that was just market women's bodies, body stories, Fitz decided. Once or twice, riding down the high street, he thought he'd seen her, a hunched figure in rags with a young child, begging to avoid the workhouse. But it was hard to say. Most women looked much the same, and when they were poor and dirty, indistinguishable one from the other. Things improved when he went to Cambridge. Away from Pemberley and in a different college, George had a narrower scope for pinning all his misdeeds on Fitz, requiring as it did the corroboration of tutors and deans. It had been a lovely freedom for Fitz to be judged solely on his own merits. More than one master had encouraged him to take orders and pursue a full degree. It might not be a bad life, but of course out of the question for someone of his wealth and position. Fitz had prolonged his gentleman's course of study as long as he dared, sorry when the two years were up and he had to come home again. George, a year behind, was struggling, fighting the temptations of town wenches and convivial drinking friends and losing the battle. And still it went on. George continued to proclaim his love for Fitz, still begged for help in his studies. What an intro. Alright. Okay. Hold on. Okay. Okay. Somebody up in the bar doesn't like us. Yes, that's hell. That's the demons. knowing an inch too far and the game would be over. Either Fitz would reveal the truth at last or they'd both be ruined. All for George's crimes, all for love. Fitz had thought the world well lost then, and almost it had been, until his father died, still hoping for, if not quite believing in, his only son's eventual redemption. Then the game had ceased to matter to George. He had demanded his cut, as he called it, as if his entire life had been devoted to some elaborate swindle that was about to pay off. You don't think I've been bending over for you out of love. Even you aren't that blind, are you? But wait, you wanted it too, didn't you? How many times had George initiated another encounter? Not directly, perhaps, not in words, but signaling with his eyes or his mouth, the tip of his tongue, just beginning to show through parted lips, sometimes just a very slight swivel of the hips that he wanted fits. I would never have done anything, Wick, if I didn't think you wanted it. George's only answer was another sneer. Such a gentleman. Next you'll write me sonnets and give me a ring. God wished he had George at his mercy just one last time. He'd show him what real force was. He'd been gentle and loving, even as a boy, when his whole body had seemed to surge out of control for a continuous period of five years. He had only to look at George and think of him. His smile, his fine fair hair, and his clean profile. His slender limbs with their surprisingly chiseled muscular look beneath the clothes that softened him. And that amazingly large prick, unexpected on such a slender man, and seemingly always hard, or able to get there at a moment's notice, 
as soon as they had a chance alone. But Fitz usually tried to hold back so as not to hurt him, until that last time, after the taunts and the contempt. Then he had laid into George with the full power of his lust. And only then had George shared in the passion, coming into the straw, gasping and moaning, just like Fitz. You see, Fitz said, you do like it. Oh, any man's pistol will discharge when he's rammed deep enough, George said, trying to appear unmoved by what had just occurred, struggling to keep his voice level. Doesn't mean love any more than that ugly old tomcat of yours loves the pusses he screws on his night prowl. But all those years, Fitz said. Yes, Darcy, what else was I supposed to do when my lord's son wanted to have his way with me? And me just the son of the poor steward. But that's finished now. I'll take my share. God knows I've earned it and more. And I'll have the living I was promised. Well, none of this was anything he could write to a lady. There was enough he could say without offense. The generous inheritance misspent and wasted. The demand for more money to study the law. The repeated failures and the last renunciation of all help, including living, in return for 3,000 pounds. I knew he ought not to be a clergyman, Fitz wrote, grimacing at the dumb heap of depravity concealed by the phrase. God, he wished he had her in the straw just now. He would show her what a gentleman he was. No, no, he did not. There was nothing similar between Elizabeth Bennet and the man who had betrayed his trust. She was innocent and good while George was wicked and practiced in deceit. Any resemblance between them was superficial, the happenstance of physical likeness. Both slim and full of life, with their quick silver changes, witty and pretty, teasing and laughing. George had used it all for treachery, for extortion and blackmail, for cheating and lying and letting others take the blame. But she was all purity. If she had let him on, it was due to her artlessness, not deliberate seduction. It was Fitz's pride that had brought him to the edge of this precipice, so confident of success that he had pursued the distant horizon instead of watching the path under his feet. He was fortunate to have been pulled up before tumbling over the edge, however painful her reigning in. What a narrow escape he had had, almost married into that mob of grasping, vulgar jackdaws, his noble family name and lineage forever tainted. No, he would simply answer her charges and then he would leave, go back to town and forget her, as if that were possible. He wished just once to have George again, but the need passed, and with it, the desire. Hey.